Okay, well, welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, for those that, that don't know who I am, my name is Sean Butcher, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Heritage Frederick, and I also am chair of the Collections Committee. And I've had the fortune also to coordinate a couple programs for the organization from time to time. And I'm pleased to uh, bring together our second uh, Heritage Frederick at Home virtual series. So we appreciate you tuning in. Before I introduce our guest tonight, just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, first, we'd like to um, thank FCB Bank, who's been a loyal supporter and friend of ours for a number of our programs and activities. So we wanna give them a shout out and acknowledge their uh, participation and support of, of Heritage Frederick over the past couple of years. And then uh, I'd like to also invite people and encourage people to, at the end of the program, to complete a, a brief survey. It's literally just six questions, uh, but we uh, received some wonderful feedback uh, after the last virtual session, and hopefully it uh, enhanced this program as well as future programs, and also gave us ideas for future programs. So uh, please just hang on at the end for uh, that program. And then at the end of Jared's presentation, uh, I will facilitate a, a question and answer uh, period. And so if you have questions, we encourage you to uh, use the Q&A or question box and just type in your question there. I will be able to facilitate and moderate those. Um, and, um, and please use that function you know, throughout the program. And we can, we can always circle back and, and get to questions for Jared uh, afterwards. Also at the end of the session, uh, we will have a little teaser for our next virtual program. Uh, and, um, and so stay tuned for that. You'll be the first to hear what we have planned next. And I think it's also exciting. And, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have the caliber of programs and uh, knowledgeable historians and authors and experts that um, we are landing, including uh, my next guest. So Jared Frederick is uh, a friend of mine. He's been a friend of mine for a number of years. Uh, and he has a lifelong passion for American history. He began his first book at the end of his freshman year in high school. And then by the second year in college, he had published three books for young adults. He is the author of two images of modern America books, including one focusing on Altoona, which is where he hails from, as well as Gettysburg, which I'll mention in a minute. Jared received his bachelor's degree from Penn State University and his master's degree from West Virginia University, Go Mountaineers. And uh, prior to taking on his job as a uh, professor of history, he uh, served as a seasonal ranger for the National Park Service, both at Harper's Ferry National Historic, Historic Park and Gettysburg Military Park. He's well knowledgeable about the subject that he's gonna talk about. He's a World War II reenactor. Uh, he uh, is a uh, illustrator, which maybe we'll talk, to, talk about at the end. And then one of the things that I think is really cool about uh, Jared, is he, Jared is he, he got to host a Turner Classic Movies uh, program during the channel's 25th anniversary. Uh, one of the programs that he did for me a number of years ago, uh, you can actually still watch on C-SPAN about women in Gettysburg. So without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Jared Frederick. Thank you, Sean, very much. I'm glad to be here with everybody at Heritage Frederick tonight. And uh, as I uh, discussed with uh, Sean a moment ago, um, I really hope I can uh, come down uh, sometime in person and uh, perhaps discuss my next book, uh, which will uh, be coming out in the coming months. Uh, but tonight we are going to be discussing my most recent book, which came out last year for the 75th anniversary of the Normandy invasion. And my book is entitled Dispatches of D-Day, A People's History of the Normandy Invasion. And I am often asked, what exactly does that subtitle mean? And I think over the course of our presentation tonight, uh, it will become very evident what I am inferring. Uh, and so my book is not your typical D-Day book. It is not a book that looks at generals, command decisions, uh, strategy, or a lot of politics. It touches on all of those things, but it is not its sole emphasis. Uh, rather, the book talks about, for the most part, people that you've never heard of and otherwise would never hear of. And two of the people that we'll be talking about this evening among them were actually from 
Frederick, Maryland, uh, who are featured in my book. And so I'll be really happy to share their stories with you as we move along tonight. In an ironic sort of way, our story begins where for so many it ended. I visited Normandy for the first time in uh, 2013. It was in March of 2013, and I was traveling with a number of college students. And I had the unfortunate distinction of visiting Normandy during the largest snowstorm in a century. Uh, it was, uh, you know, like an act of God, very unusual uh, for that time of year. Uh, and it, it greatly deterred our trip itinerary. But nonetheless, uh, the final day of our trip was spent in the Normandy American Cemetery. And by that point, as we can see from this background photo that I snapped, uh, the snow had melted. It had been replaced by rain. It was dreary. As you can see from the photograph on the right, I am in a rather soaked state uh, there overlooking Omaha Beach. And for as dreary as it was, it was a rather soulful experience um, because once again, as this photograph would indicate, there was nobody else in the cemetery. Uh, many of the students had gone back to the visitor center to dry out and it was just me and it was just them. Uh, I was alone in the cemetery. And what made this even more evocative was the fact that it was 20 years to the day that my grandfather, a D-Day veteran had passed away. And I've always said, that it's been one of the great regrets of my life that I never had the opportunity to come to know my grandfather better and to hear his stories firsthand. Uh, but as I was walking through the cemetery on the anniversary of his death, I realized how lucky I was because he lived 49 years longer than all of the men buried beneath these tombstones before me. Uh, and so, this visit was one of the things that spurred my ambition to understand the stories in, of these forgotten individuals uh, to a higher degree. And I found increasingly that American newspapers were the best way to find these stories. Over the last 15 years, tens of thousands of American periodicals have been digitized, making the past more accessible than ever. And had I wished to write this book 20 years ago, I don't think it would have been possible because I would have had to have gone to every historical society across the country and gone through miles of microfilm in the effort to find stories. And even then, it would have been a roll of the dice. Uh, and so my quest started out in an initial research phase with not wanting to write a book necessarily in mind, uh, but I was hooked. And I ended up transcribing 300,000 words in firsthand accounts about the Normandy invasion. Those who witnessed it, those who experienced it, and those on the home front. And it was a very emotional and personal experience along the way. And it is these stories from these newspapers that comprise the text within my book. One of the most frequently examined newspapers that I look at in my research uh, was Stars and Stripes, the military newspaper that is still in publication to this very day. And this quote from the spring of 1944, I think really gets to one of the, the core elements, one of the core meanings of my book. And this is what this newspaper had to say to these soldiers who were preparing for the Normandy invasion. And it said, the quest to self-educate will in and of itself make you a better informed soldier, a better educated American. And in the days ahead, when it becomes your job to decide issues on which the future all depends, your knowledge of the big picture will make you a better citizen. And in a small way, that will help make this a better world. And this gets to the core of one of the reasons why Americans perceive themselves fighting in the Second World War, the freedom of the press, the access to information and a celebration of literacy were hallmarks of the democratic belief, uh, the very idea of representative government. And in their minds, what do fascists do from the very get-go? They go after the press and they try to squash free speech. And this is when and how a lot of these ideas begin to materialize in the heads of American fighters. Uh, but of course, in the months before the invasion itself, 
there is a massive buildup of men and material in the British Isles. And the British still refer to this sudden influx of Americans and allies to this very day as the friendly invasion. And one person who often wrote and observed about the so-called friendly invasion was the young man who we see on the left of the screen, future CBS journalist, uh, Andy Rooney, uh, who actually got his start as an army journalist with Stars and Stripes. And Andy Rooney wrote about this peculiar sort of species of an American GI known as the Piccadilly Commando, uh, who was a, a very flirtatious uh, young soldier uh, who had often hit the town and often get the best of himself. Uh, and in these sorts of environments where everything in Britain had been rationed, uh, things like chocolate bars, Lucky Strike cigarettes, uh, Wrigley Spearmint, uh, silk or nylon stockings were worth their weight in gold, as we can see from this picture in the background. And sometimes the friendly invasion got a little bit too friendly because in the months uh, before, during, and after the Normandy invasion, uh, there were about 20,000 Anglo American babies born out of wedlock. Um, and so this is not what they had in mind necessarily when they talked about, you know, tying the bonds of the alliance between the two countries. Uh, but it was, it was what it was. Young people lived in the moment and these sorts of lifestyles and uh, where they're exerting their energies, shall we say, uh, are kind of indicative of that, of them living in the moment. And in a way, you know, who can blame them? Despite this overwhelming sense of unity and togetherness and a sense of purpose, we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the fact that there are also American shortcomings here in 1944, particularly the fact that the U.S. military was still segregated, and it would remain so until the year 1948. In Great Britain, there was no Keller line, there was no segregation or Jim Crow, and many black troops came to the conclusion that they were treated better in a foreign country than what they were in their own country. And as one African-American sergeant later said, we black troops went overseas to fight the Germans, but we had to fight the Yanks first. But from this conflict and from the one million plus African-Americans who were serving in uniform, there was this devout conviction that their heroics and their gallantry in uniform would help pave the way for the civil rights that they should have been entitled to to begin with. And one of the great champions of this idea was the Pittsburgh Courier, America's most widely read African-American newspaper. And during the conflict, that periodical started what was known as the Double V Campaign, victory overseas and victory at home. And it was exactly what it inferred, that by uh, serving with gallantry overseas, that it would pave the way to a better America in which people would be entitled to a fuller sense of rights. Uh, and so we don't often think of D-Day in this way, uh, but it serves as a brick in the foundation of the civil rights movement that would be coming. More on that to come. Now, when we talk about the invasion day, you know, that was a point of big speculation in the spring of 1944. But if you were to ask a member of the Army Air Forces when the invasion was to begin, they would say it's already begun. Because since late 1942, the Army Air Forces had been bombing Nazi occupied countries as well as Nazi Germany itself. And these airmen went through horrific conditions flying in these uncompressed planes at 50,000 feet wearing Arctic suits. And there were more Americans lost over the skies of Western Europe than what was lost by the U.S. Marine Corps in the entirety of the war in the Pacific against the Japanese. So this was a very, very brutal affair. Uh, but uh, in the words of Henry Hap Arnold, who was uh, the Air Force's chief at this time, he kind of alluded to this war of attrition that was ongoing, that America was going to win uh, not ju just by its conviction, but by its overwhelming manpower, by its industrial line capacity. And as Hap Arnold told reporters that spring, he said, we are invading and not at some remote beachhead. We are hitting the enemy where he lives. 
He knows if he cannot stop us, he's left. Uh, and so that really speaks to kind of the broader manner in which the allies are fighting the war. Uh, one could say uh, quantity over quality is how the Americans plan to defeat Nazi Germany. And this photograph is perhaps the best indicator of that sort of assembly line fashion of supplies uh, that is unfolding both at home and overseas. Here we see a port in Devon, England, just a few days before the invasion takes place. In the background, we see these very versatile vessels that were known as LSTs or landing ship tanks. And as we can see in this photograph, uh, they had a hatch that would open at the bow where they could literally take uh, supplies and vehicles from ship to shore. And one observer to the, this vast logistical process said that it was like a mechanical Niagara. And he encouraged visitors to picture Niagara Falls, but instead of water, they were to envision, you know, just this overwhelming amount of supplies and crates and vehicles and tires and rations and weapons and everything imaginable. And it was just this unending flow of supplies that was intended to support the Normandy invasion, which would be the biggest amphibious operation up until that point in world history. The man who is tasked with leading this great endeavor, believe it or not, is a man who had never been in combat. His name is Dwight D. Eisenhower, who lived just a mere 45 minutes up the road after World War II from Frederick in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And at face value, Eisenhower put on a, a very confident demeanor, especially to the, the, the press who reported him. And Anne O'Hare McCormick of the New York Times said of his predicament, never has the fate of so many depended on the judgment of so few. Another reporter said that it seemed like each one of the four stars on Eisenhower's shoulder, it seemed like each one of them weighed a ton. Such was the burden of command that had been placed upon him. Secretly, Eisenhower was a nervous wreck. He was smoking four or five packs of cigarettes a day, something that would later give him a heart attack later on in his presidency. And he is taking everything into account, including the possibility of failure. And the day before the invasion, he scribbles this note, which is to be released to the press in the case that Operation Overlord, the invasion, fails. And in that letter, he essentially puts forth an admission of guilt saying that it was not the fault of the combatants, the responsibility rests with me alone. And that is a true sign of his leadership, that he was taking every possibility into account, including that of failure. He was taking full responsibility, and that is best indicated in this letter that he writes but is never released to the press. The most telling thing about it is how he dates it at the bottom. You may note, that he signed it July 5th instead of June 5th. Dwight Eisenhower is such a nervous wreck on the eve of the invasion that he signs this note with the wrong month. It's a very telling small subtlety of this letter and of his state of mind. Luckily for all of us though, uh, this instead is the letter that is distributed to the troops, much like the ones that we see on these naval bunks here in the background. And this becomes known as Eisenhower's Order of the Day. And it starts off, you are about to embark upon a great, the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. And so Eisenhower invoked religious connotations here. Uh, signifying this as a great crusade. And indeed, this was an army not set out to conquer, it was an army set out to liberate. And it is something very unique in the annals of world history. This is the only map that is in my book. Uh, it's one that I drew up myself. And you know, as I said, this is not a book about strategy or divisions moving from this beachhead to that river to that mountain. Uh, all that said, it's important to have a little bit of geographic context to have some understanding 
where and how these armies and the characters within are moving. As many of you might be aware, there are five major beachheads, and going from west to east, there are Utah and Omaha, which are American sectors, and then there is Gold, and then on the far right, uh, Sword, which are British beaches, and they bookend a Canadian sector that is codenamed Juno. It is about a 50 mile wide beachhead, and on June 6, 1944, well over 150,000 combatants will be pouring ashore in these five sectors, squaring off with approximately 50,000 German defenders. One of the key targets in the broader Normandy campaign that will follow is to capture the port city of Cherbourg, located up at the end here of the peninsula. That is one of the few deep water ports in France that can accommodate the amount of ships necessary to sustain the flow of supplies for the Allied armies. And from this, we can see how the bigger picture of Normandy begins to unfold. The mission starts in the pre-dawn hours shortly after midnight on June 6, 1944, and it begins with about 13,000 Allied paratroopers dropped behind enemy lines from about 700 airplanes, much like the ones that we see here. These troops were meant to serve as a buffer between the, the bulk of the German defenders and the troops who would be hitting the beaches shortly after 6 a.m., just a few hours hence. And they were intended to stir up trouble behind the lines, cut communications, create chaos on the part of the Germans, and it was a very scaring and daunting endeavor. It was estimated that perhaps 80% of them might die in the wake of all of this. Luckily, the casualty rates were not that extreme, but for any of you who have ever gone skydiving, that is scary enough as it is, but in this case, you're doing so in the darkness with 100 pounds of gear strapped to you while people are shooting at you, and the Germans also flooded the fields and pastures. Uh, in expectation of this, so paratroopers would drown by the weight of their equipment that was strapped to them. It was a very deadly affair. And this painting here in the background uh, certainly shows us the scale of that operation in its earliest moments. Among those men dropping into France that night were a platoon of paratroopers from the 101st Airborne who were colorfully known as the Filthy 13. And uh, these were a, a very gung-ho bunch of warriors who uh, shaved their heads mohawk style, put on war paint, uh, carried bowie knives and brass knuckles. They had not bathed since the month of December because they, were, they wanted to get accustomed to living rough out in the field and so on and so forth. And uh, they really gained a reputation for themselves as these bloodthirsty combatants. And as far as Stars and Stripes was concerned, they said of these soldiers, pity the poor Nazi who encounters them. And truer words were never spoken in regard to reporting on the invasion. The Filthy 13 have a unique cultural legacy today um, because it is this ragtag group of paratroopers that the 1967 movie, The Dirty Dozen, is based on. Uh, so a very colorful anecdotal legacy uh, for sure. Meanwhile, about 5,000 ships are circling and gathering off the Normandy coast, getting ready for the next big phase of the push-off. And one naval captain said of this scene, one could use all the adjectives such as colossal, magnificent, stupendous, marvelous, greatest, immense, and still not give any idea to the number of men and material being moved. And this photograph that we see on the screen offers us just a, a very small snapshot of the overwhelming number of ships and troops that are about to hit the shore in the coming hours, days, weeks, and months. This is going to be a major stepping stone for the broader war against Nazi Germany. Among my favorite stories in the book 
One of them deals with a dog named Muffin. And Muffin was a cur dog that American soldiers picked up out of the gutters of England somewhere. And they made this dog their unit mascot. And they decided that they were going to take him to France with them. And so these soldiers were placed on one of the landing craft, much like we see here in the background. And one of the sailors operating this landing craft was a young man by the name of Lawrence Patman. And he took notice of the dog and he heard its name being uttered and he thought that that was kind of a, a cute good luck charm that these soldiers had brought with them. But shortly thereafter, the landing craft suffered a direct strike and men flew into the air, fell into the water, were killed, perhaps drowned by the weight of the equipment that they were bearing. And Patman, too, was among those flung into the water. And when he finally came to, he tried to swim to some nearby debris, and he recognized that his hand had swollen to the size of a football. And he thought, this is it. I'm going to die here in the middle of the English Channel. My family's not going to know what happened to me. But ultimately, his salvation was announced with a dog's bark. Muffin the dog had survived the blast, was paddling around in the water, and Patman called out to the dog and said, here Muffin, here boy. And Patman later recounted to a reporter, he said, I'll be damned if the dog didn't come over and start licking my face. And so with his good arm, uh, Patman uh, rested his limb over the dog who served as an improvised flotation device. And within an hour or so, Patman and the dog were rescued by a British patrol boat. Patman had his arm amputated later that day. It was crushed beyond healing. Uh, but as he later attested, that dog saved his life. And so as we can see from this tale, sometimes Truth is stranger than fiction. You couldn't make up a story like this, but yet here it happened on June 6th, 1944. Among the first American troops to hit the beach were the soldiers of the 4th Infantry Division. And this was my grandfather's division. And uh, my grandfather was among these thousands of men uh, to go ashore that morning. And they landed at Utah Beach, which was one of the lighter defended beaches. And as we can see from this photograph on the right, uh, they are, you know, inching their way up to the seawall and then quickly pushing inland, uh, where they are going to meet fierce resistance beyond the beachhead. Despite this accomplishment and despite the success of this mission, uh, the men of the famous fourth, so to speak, uh, thought that they were overlooked in the press reports of the invasion. And as Stars and Stripes later attested, the boys of the Ivy Division heard that a lot of people were getting credit for the Allied advances in France. That is almost everybody but the fourth. And this is revealing in so many ways because it shows us that American soldiers felt that if they were succeeding and if they were fighting heroically, then they deserved to have that recognition in print so other soldiers and those at home would know about it. And so there were many angry letters to the editor from the ranks of the 4th Infantry Division saying, hey, what about us? And the newspaper quickly to rectify that issue as a result. But another reason perhaps why Utah Beach and the fighting there is so often overlooked is because of the wholesale slaughter that was experienced on a beach just a few miles down the coast known as Omaha Beach. And among the men of the 29th Infantry Division who were going ashore that day uh, was this man who we see on the right, both in young and old age. And his name was Harold Bumgarten. And he was a New York City Jew who was a very talented baseball player. And uh, right before the invasion, he painted a Star of David on the back of his jacket so his Aryan enemies would know exactly who he was and that he intended to take the fight to them. Uh, but his combat life was very short-lived. 
as an article from the Nebraska State Journal later attested as to Bumgarten's experiences. Shell fragments creased his skull and S mine shattered his knee and machine gun bullets smashed the small bones of his right foot. A blast also exploded in front of him, ripping off the bottom part of his jaw. And as Bumgarten later said, uh, the skin of his cheek was flapping up over his ear. And this young man was just a bloodied mess. And a lot of people thought that there was no way he was going to survive. But medics salvaged him from the chaos of the beachhead. Over the following year, he went over a dozen reconstructive surgeries. And after the war, he became a doctor because he wanted to help people in the same way that he was helped during World War II. And Dr. Bumgarten passed away just about three years ago. He was in his 90s and the last 30 years of his life, he dedicated to telling the stories of his fellow comrades who did not survive that day and the war. Um, as many of you might be aware, the 29th Infantry Division, also known as the Blue and the Gray Division, had a large contingent of troops from Maryland in it. And among them were a number of soldiers from Frederick. And so I would now like to just read a very short portion of my book to you that talks about one of those soldiers. And that soldier's name was William J. Mask, a soldier from Frederick. And this is what I write about his experiences on Omaha Beach. Mask and company were greeted with inauspicious steel spiders mounted with explosives protruding from the seaway. Each had the capacity to blow a landing craft sky high. As his boat delicately maneuvered the shoreline, its deck was consumed by an 88 millimeter shell. Survivors lunged over the side into 12 feet of water, many being pulled under never to rise again. I lost my equipment when I hit the shore. I had nothing to fight with, Mask wrote in Maryland's Frederick News. The Germans had covered us with murderous machine gun fire, and most of my company was casualties before they got ashore. I crawled 50 yards until I was hit. With his weapon at the bottom of the channel and his thumb splintered by shrapnel, Mask helplessly curled in the sand for the next 16 hours before he was evacuated. And so that was one of the lucky survivors, a young man from Frederick, much like Harold Bumgarten. In this immediate aftermath of the invasion, we also get a sense of the heroics of the medics and also of the female nurses who are working on many of these hospital ships. And among one of the other female witnesses to the Normandy invasion was a reporter from Collier's Weekly by the name of Martha Gellhorn. And she fought tooth and nail to try to cover the invasion. You know, the military and the press was a man's world. She really had to struggle to get to the top to cover this big story. And one of her greatest competitors was her own husband, a guy that you may have heard of named Ernest Hemingway, who also worked for the same magazine. Uh, but Martha Gellhorn stowed away on a hospital ship. She locked herself in the ship's lavatory until the, the ship was under sail, and she became the first female correspondent to step on Normandy soil on the evening of June 6th. And of these overwhelming number of wounded, she wrote to her readers, it will be hard to tell you of the wounded. There were so many of them. There was no time to talk. There was too much else to do. And it really gives you a sense of the chaos in those initial moments of the aftermath. There was another soldier from Frederick, Maryland, and I'm gonna read another brief portion of my book here. And this young man attested to this aftermath that he found on the beaches. Corporal Victor M. Wingate of Frederick, Maryland offered heartfelt testimony in a letter published by his hometown newspaper. He said, American boys looked into merciless guns uh, uh, belching Nazi venom, he remembered. The shell cratered landscape, mountains of abandoned equipment, and half buried gear were poignant affirmations of sacrifice. Scattered among the machines of war, Wingate continued, are many abandoned personal items that historians should not fail to recapture 
when they paint this picture for future Americans to view. Very heartfelt words indeed. And uh, amazingly enough, that same sort of sentiment was conveyed by the best known reporter in America at that time. And his name was Ernie Pyle. And Ernie Pyle said of this scene, uh, he said, on the beach lay expended sufficient men and mechanism for a small war. They were gone forever now, and yet we could afford it. And in saying this, Ernie Pyle also attested to this personal debris of war that was left behind on the beaches. Uh, diaries, journals, tennis rackets, guitars, toothbrushes, rosaries, and all of those things were symbolic of the men who would not be using those items anymore. And certainly this image that we see here in the background is a very grim testimony to that sort of carnage that was being inflicted at that given time. Pardon me. Another thing that my book discusses that is often overlooked is the story of the home front on D Day. How were people reacting to news of the invasion? At first, they didn't really know if they were to celebrate, mourn. They weren't entirely sure. And I think this sign that was showing up on the front door of a synagogue in New York City that day is really a testament to the level of solidarity that Americans were feeling at that given moment. And it says, this synagogue will be open for 24 hours for special services on D-Day. All are welcome. So once more, you know, it speaks to that sense of, of unity. Uh, people were putting aside their differences, even if temporarily in many cases. And photos like this, as well as ones like this from Times Square in New York City are very poignant evidence of that. And people gathered here in New York City under the, the ticker board of Times Square with the news scroll, scrolling across it. And they just stood there for hours in this, this sort of daze, uh, perhaps unsure or transfixed as to how to act. And uh, these photographs were taken by a, a government worker who just wandered around New York City in order to capture th the mood and the sentiment of the people on that day. Despite this sense of seeming solidarity, this was not the case everywhere. Because simultaneous with D-Day, there were also a number of strikes that were going on in, in various military and industrial plants at that given moment. And one of the most notable of these occurred in Cincinnati, where a Wright Aeronautical plant shut down for several days as the invasion was ongoing. And the reason why the factory shut down is because the plant had just hired six African-American workers to work in the metal shop. And all of the white workers seemingly did not like this, and they went on strike as a result. And to its credit, the Cincinnati Post called out these workers and said, you right workers, what will you say of the fathers and the mothers of those men who fall in France? Something else very interesting that was happening in June of 1944 is that the Ku Klux Klan actually dissolved, although it promised to rematerialize once the war was over. And so, you know, civil rights and this idea of D-Day being a new birth of freedom was something that was very much on the minds of many Americans, including those in the African-American community. And there was one Michigan newspaper that said it best, uh, you know, when it said, you know, 
are white soldiers more afraid of black armed soldiers beside them or are they more afraid of the German soldiers who are white like themselves? And it's hard to argue with a certain level of logic like that. These issues though were probably far from the minds of many soldiers on the front lines, uh, including members of the 101st Airborne in Carentan, France. And exactly two weeks after D-Day, uh, members of this division gathered in the town square of Carentan, which they had fought desperately for. And it was not necessarily the award ceremony that interested me most, but rather what happened afterward. Um, because not too far away from this, after the ceremony, these troopers were taken into a nearby YMCA, shall we say, that was called Le Jean d'Arc. And they were shown the recently released Mickey Rooney comedy that was known as Andy Hardy's Blonde Trouble. And so, you know, all these young guys were in this theater and they, they were smoking and slapping each other on the back and making cat calls about, you know, the women in the movie and so on and so forth. And I found this such a telling moment because for those 90 minutes, those guys were kids again. And this theater, which had only shown German movies over the previous four years of occupation, the town had its theater back. And that was a very emotional, you know, act of liberation here. You know, it's very telling. And even more telling is that for many of the young men in that theater, it would be the last movie that they ever saw. So there are all sorts of, you know, human elements and human stories that we can find in this. And this is true even 75 plus years later. Henry and Louis Piper were two young sailors who were killed when their ship, LST-523, hit an underwater mine two weeks after D-Day. The Piper brothers were 19-year-old twins. And these two boys who were born on the same day end up losing their lives on the same day. And I can only imagine what their parents went through, going through that sort of pain and misery. In death, their bodies were separated. They ended up in two different cemeteries in the years after the war. But thanks to a high schooler who was doing a history day project, she found out where the other brother was buried. And just two years ago, the Piper twins were reunited in death at the Normandy American Cemetery. And their nieces and nephews, family members that they had never even met, help see to this reunion and it, it speaks to you know the emotional heartache and also the relevance that d-day has and i'm sure many of you watching tonight had family members who fought in the second world war and their stories are so telling and so meaningful even three quarters of a century later this was certainly on the mind of dwight eisenhower as he took into consideration the toll that was struck in the name of liberation. And as we look at these sorts of pictures from the Normandy American Cemetery, the nearly 10,000 graves that are there, 75 years later, we must ask, what do we owe the dead? How do we carry on their traditions and what they fought for? And Dwight Eisenhower himself had the perfect answer to this, in my view. Immediately after the invasion, he told members of the press, our countries fight best when our people are best informed. I should feel disturbed if I thought that I or my public relations staff were held as anything but friends of the press. I will never tell you anything false. And so in Eisenhower's view, honesty, and also that, that importance of that access to information and a celebration of literacy, being good and active and engaged and knowledgeable citizens, that was how we could best honor the dead. 
And these words remain highly relevant even today. And when Eisenhower revisited Normandy in 1964, now an old man trekking these old battlefields, he toured these battlegrounds as well as the American cemetery with CBS journalist Walter Cronkite. And as he looked out on the American cemetery, he said, I devoutly hope that we will never again have to see such scenes as these. I think and hope and pray humanity will learn more than we had learned up to that time. But these people gave us a chance and they bought time for us so that we can do better than we have before. And all of these years later, we must ask ourselves that very important question. What are we going to do with that chance that was presented to us on June 6th, 1944. Thank you for coming out to uh, my presentation this evening and joining me from the comfort of your own home and our digital platform. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Jared. And uh, that was a wonderful presentation. I know we could have, it could have lasted much longer. So um, thank you for not only infusing you know humanity and people and history but also geography military um a little bit of military tactics and everything so thank you uh we have some questions and uh, if again i want to encourage folks if they have questions to um make sure that you go ahead and and um put it in the q a but i'll i'll kick things off uh, a little bit and i'll just throw you a softball question uh, have you been back to Normandy since uh, that inaugural and initial trip that you shared with us? Uh, yes, in fact, and it looks like my video has has disappeared, but I hope you can all still hear me all right. Um, yes, I did return to Normandy uh, last summer, as, as a matter of fact, and I went over with a group of friends, and we spent about eight or nine days in France. And, you know, we really got the, the full perspective. Uh, we went a few weeks after the 75th anniversary because we knew how insane it would be um, with all the world leaders. Uh, and so uh, we, we still got to uh, participate in a number of 75th anniversary uh, activities, uh, including the anniversary of a liber the liberations of a number of French towns. Uh, and, and so we, we had a grand old time and uh, the people of Normandy are still so very appreciative of what uh, Americans and British and French soldiers did 75 years ago. And that's, you know, definitely on my bucket list uh, one day get to, um, uh, my, I had a grandfather that served in the Navy, uh, not a D-Day, he was concentrated in the Pacific, but, uh, and, I, and like you alluded to, many of our, um, you know, many, many of our folks that are listening and, and folk and, and others have relatives that, that served uh, during that time period and in combat. Um, how, the, another question is, how does one set out on a research project like the one that you undertook in terms of, uh, particularly uh, magazine or newspaper articles and the like. Are you there? All right, so we may have lost Jared. Let's see if we can get him back. Um, let me, and I see that other questions have come in as well. Um, so while we have, while Jared tries to reconnect, let me share with you a little bit about uh, our next program and then hopefully we can get back to some questions. Um, if you are interested in his book, I would encourage you to uh, go to his website, uh, history, uh, biz, or historymatters.biz. You can order this book as well as uh, any of the other books that, he, that he's talked about. And then um, I, I want to go ahead and tease while we have a moment. 
our next program, which as many of you know, uh, this year and actually just uh, next week, marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And all, also on August 26th, it happens to also be Women's Equality Day. And so we have a mother-daughter duo who has, uh, as part of a living history program, um, uh, undertaken Alice Paul. And so the daughter plays Alice Paul at an earlier age and, and, her, and, and her mom uh, actually undertakes um, uh, Alice Paul in a, in a much older age. And they do a fabulous presentation, uh, one that actually was the Maryland Humanities Council just did a few uh, weeks ago as part of their Chautauqua program. Uh, and then both of these two uh, also will uh, be doing this for the Alice Paul Institute in, in just uh, a few short days as well. So we're really excited to uh, announce that they will be participating in our next virtual program. You all are the, are the first to hear it. Um, of, and then you'll get more registration details and information uh, in the coming days. So we're really excited about that. In fact, uh, the mother, Liz Cannon, is actually a Frederick resident. So we, it's great to have wonderful experts like that in our community. And they'll be able to also talk about some of the work uh, in terms of the suffrage movement that took place right here in Frederick and Frederick County as well. So um, since I don't have, um, since I don't have Jared back, I think we'll just have to, uh, wrap it up early. Uh, thank you all very much. This is a wonderful world of Zoom and, uh, and virtual programming, as you never know what uh, will happen. And also, uh, I was worried the beginning, at the beginning about the storm that was moving in and, and whether that would in, impact uh, folks as well in terms of connectivity and electricity and everything else. So thank you all very much for participating. I hope that you will uh, give us some feedback uh, with the survey that will pop up now. So thank you very much.